Hi, greetings. This is Lou Augusta. Welcome to A Rumor of Empathy. Today, our show is entitled Five More Recommendations on How to Expand Your Empathy. So we're going to get right into it. A thought for the day. We begin with a thought for the day. Empathy is like oxygen for the soul. That's worth repeating. Empathy is like oxygen for the soul. So if one is experiencing a shortness of breath, maybe you need more empathy in your relationships, commitments, or career. My commitment and the commitment of this show and the work I do is to expand empathy in the community and in our individual relatedness and to expand the flow of oxygen to the soul so that you and I both can breathe easier. So this is a metaphor. Empathy is like oxygen for the soul. But when people do not get enough empathy, and the short list of related things such as dignity, common courtesy, respect, fairness, humanity, when people don't get the acknowledgement and recognition to which they're entitled as a human being, and sometimes they just feel they're entitled, then they not only feel that they can't breathe, they lose a feeling of vitality. One loses a feeling of aliveness. Meaning life, the meaning of life, the purpose of life seems to get lost. And when people lose the feeling of vitality, aliveness, dignity, then things can go off the rails. People start behaving in self-defeating ways. They act out. They tell someone off in a way that's not effective or dignified. They engage in self-defeating behaviors, alcohol or drug abuse, or unprotect unprotected sex with people they don't really know very well. If the person's a teenager, they ride their skateboard down the middle of Interstate 94, which is a bad idea, a very bad idea. Don't hurt yourself. All bad jokes aside, things get significant and serious. People get hurt. Families get destroyed. People engage in these risky and self-defeating activities in order to restore their own sense of emotional equilibrium, in order to get back a sense of emotional stability, a sense of wholeness and of well-being. And in the examples just given, of course, it doesn't work. People act out in order to get back a feeling of aliveness and vitality and overcome the feeling of deadness that results when people lack empathy in their life. Empathy is like oxygen for the soul. Now, knowing that, understanding that is a good first step in recovery, but knowing it doesn't necessarily make a difference, right? We're up against, okay, fancy term, cognitive impenetrability. We all know, I know it, but how does this knowing make a difference? We all know that flying by an airplane is much safer than driving, getting behind the wheel of a car. I'm not nervous when I get behind the wheel of my auto, whereas, full disclosure, I do get nervous. I'm stuffed back there in coach in a stress position, and the airplane is turning onto the runway. I hear the engines revving up. I know it's safer than driving, but I'm more nervous, right? So... The short recommendation is to find other activities and relationships and similar in which one gets a feeling of vitality, aliveness, wholeness. It's easier said than done. It's easier said than done. If your hobbies, if my hobbies already gave me that, there wouldn't be a problem. I wouldn't, I mean, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Now there's nothing wrong with hobbies. I mean, that's great, right? But maybe... Consider the possibility one needs to engage in a process of introspection, reflection. What am I up to in my life that enlivens, opens opportunities, opens possibilities? One may need or want or find it useful 
to engage in engage an empathic listener in a conversation about what's going on, what's the dynamic, what's stopping me, what's activating me in a self-defeating way. Hence, this show, right, among other things. I mean, it's one, one method. Now, a single dose, a single empathic encounter can make a difference, yes. But there's a but. Wouldn't you know it? It's easier said than done. If one's issues are years in the making, a single dose of empathy, a single empathic encounter, is probably not going to disentangle all the issues. I mean, wouldn't it be nice? Be open to miracles. But nevertheless, you know, a moment of reality, it's probably going to take some work. It's probably going to take repeated encounters, engagements with the matter at hand. So what I'm doing is creating a context for the conversation, for engaging tips and techniques on how to expand one's empathy. So I'm going to review. We started this work uh, the week before last. I mean, if you're listening to this on replay, the date, the week before last, is actually dated on the calendar June 17th, 2015. Empathy Tips and Techniques is the title. This one is more additional. I hope we get to all five. Five more empathy tips and techniques we're going to try. So we're going to briefly review what we covered in the in the uh, show we had the week before last. So one, two, three. We're going, it's going to, this is going to be more like a list than a empathic drill down, but it'll get us up to speed. It'll get us to to where we're at. So number one, be quiet and still the chatter in one's own listening to oneself, so that one can listen to the other person. I got to be quiet in order to listen. Duly acknowledged, duly noted. Number two, distinguish what the other person said from what one made it mean. Distinguish what the other person said from what I made it mean. She said, put the cap on the toothpaste. I made it mean you don't love me. Of course, this is, you know, I mean, people get crazy in this way. People get really out there. So that may be a funny, you know, it's a humorous, edgy example, but consider the possibility things like that really happen. Similarly, number three, moving right along, distinguish what happened from what I made it mean. Distinguished from what happened from what you made it mean. So the father chased the kid around the dining room table and walloped him. That's what happened. What he made it mean is that he, the kid in this case, now 20 years on, was worthless, wasn't worthy, was broken. Insert your devaluing narrative at this point. And that isn't, that, that meaning is distinct from what happened and gets in the way of understanding and relating to and being present with what happened. No, you're whole and complete. And are there some issues that need to be engaged? You betcha. Number four, you can't tell by looking. You can't. So walking down the street, I must say, it can be really interesting. More accurately, the vast majority of what you can tell by looking doesn't make a difference, right? Whether I've got uh, 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 rollerblades on or a yarmulke on or wearing a cross or a headscarf or your element of clothing of choice, uh, it, it, it seems to tell you something, but it really tells you a lot less about the humanness, the humanity. See, that's what empathy is going after. There's a human being there. So then we gave three definitions of empathy. Bada bee, bada bang, bada boom. No, close, but no cigars. I know, number one, I know what you are experiencing because I experience it also. Not as a merger as an, or as an identification, but as a vicarious experience, a trace or a feeling or a sample of what's your experience, right? Like I'm watching a movie, the movie of your life. You're the star, so to speak, or maybe the anti-hero or the unlikely star, the unsung hero, right? Where it's kind of unsung heroes on a good day and on a, on a less good, good day. And so I have a vicarious experience of what your experience is. 
you really were the shoemaker's children. All the, you know, the, the shoemaker's providing shoes for everybody, but his own family or her own family. Uh, definition number one, I know what you're experiencing as a sample, as a trace of your experience, not as a merger, as a complete identification. And this is where Right. I would not be re-traumatized. I would not be re-traumatized because I'm getting a sample. Yes, it was difficult. Yes, it was hard. But paradoxically, I mean, it sounds a little edgy, but uh, it's worth saying, yes, I suffer, assuming it was a difficult experience in which you experienced pain, but yet not too much. I'm not overwhelmed. And so empathy can act as a filter against compassion fatigue or uh, things related to that, uh, where you get burned out, in effect, a burnout for the kind of work that nurses and healing professions and helping professions do with people who are have been through traumas and difficult experiences. There's The list is long, right? So it can actually be, in that positive sense, a defense against burnout, because I know what the other is experiencing, and I do feel it. I suffer some, and yet not too much. I get my integrity and keep it. So moving right along, second definition, I walk in the other person's shoes. Folk wisdom lives. Take a walk in the other person's shoes. Here's the trick. I got to have some sense of what is your shoe size and what's the shape of your foot, right? Because otherwise it's just egocentrism and projection and what I've got shows up over there. Now that you see that you see the challenge there. So we got to have a conversation. You got to talk to the person. I mean, it helps. It makes a big difference, right? I mean, and I think, uh, you know, I, you walk in the other person's shoes knowing about them, character, personality, who they are, their way of being. I think some of this shows up, for example, in the Gospels, uh, you know, Jesus of Nazareth and the narratives there. You get some of the same idea of uh, rejecting the sin but accepting the sinner, right? You get some idea of you don't necessarily endorse the behavior, but you kind of get inside of it and you you see the humanity there. And that's, of course, I mean, nobody's endorsing bad behavior, behave yourself, you know, stop on green, go on red, pay your taxes. Nevertheless, without taking on the other person's character traits and personality, at least in imagination, what you get is an egocentric fallacy. I project my own traits onto the other person. You like strawberry ice cream. I like chocolate. Well, you know, a simple-minded example. So that's a, you know, that's a easier said than done. The devil there is in the details, as is often the case. And finally, the third definition of empathy, simply stated, being with the other person. Being with the other person without the interposition of filters, labels, judgments, categories, diagnoses, evaluations, assessments, opinions, being emotionally available to be receptive to the other person, but keeping distinct self and other, I'm an individual, you're an individual, we're distinct, being available emotioning, emotionally uh, from a first person point of view with a second person relatedness and being responsive either by a gracious and generous listening itself, a definition of empathy or responding in speech in such a way that the one person gives back to the other person, his or her experience in such a way that you demonstrate to them what you got that they were going through. So a full blown empathic receptivity, empathic, understanding the meaning of the relatedness in context and who is the other person as a possibility and then an interpretation and responsiveness to the other person. And so uh, that's the full-blown definition of empathy. Empathic receptivity, open to the other person, understanding things from their point of view, their perspective, formulating an interpretation in which one gives back to them what their experience is. Well, you really were like the shoemaker's children. Everybody got shoes, but you didn't. The shoemaker's children don't get no shoes. And then what that all means and whether that resonates and how that, well, yeah, you got it or you didn't. Now, we're gonna, coming up on a break here. And I, before we go to break, I want to 
give the next tip and technique so that we can follow through on that when we come back from a break. And that tip and technique simply stated, have an idea, get an idea up on the table of what is the impact of what one says. So I'm going to say something to you, having listened to you. What's the impact of that going to be on you, on the other person, before saying anything? An ability to predict the reaction of the other person to myself. So, right? That, I mean, that's the recommendation. Have an idea. I'm going to say something to you. I'm going to tell you something. Lou, think about how that's going to land over there. So you're going to tell me something. You think about how that's going to land over here. Is it going to work? Is it not going to work? What's the possible? We don't necessarily know for sure. So you know how like an attorney, a lawyer never asks a question unless she or he already knows the answer? Well, the empathic person, the person who's been listening and wants to respond empathically, never makes a statement to another without knowing, without having some idea how that statement is going to land, how that statement is going to affect the other person, how the other person in turn is likely to respond to one's statement. Now, I can, I think I can already hear the world getting a lot quieter. I can already sense a level of empathy. So I invite you at this point to substitute your own tough case. Call in or to discuss it on the air, 888-346-9141. I think operator Justin is standing by to take your call. Or send an email and we can work offline a rumor of empathy one word, a rumor of empathy at gmail.com. So uh, when we come back, we're about to go to break. When we come back, for example, did you ever think of saying to somebody, and I quote, do you know what your problem is? Do you know what's wrong with you? Find out what the likely result of that is going to be and how empathy plays in that one. We will be right back. See Lou on the web at louagusta.com. That is spelled L-O-U-A-G-O-S-T-A. Or phone 773-203-0269. Again, louagusta.com. Or phone 773-203-0269. You are listening to A Rumor of Empathy. To reach Lou Augusta or his guest today, please call in to 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. You may also send an email to a rumor of empathy at gmail.com. Now, back to the program. Hi, this is Lou Augusta. Welcome back to A Rumor of Empathy. Today, we're engaging with the thought, empathy is oxygen for the soul. So if you're having trouble breathing, maybe you need more empathy in your relationships, your commitments, your career. Before the break, I posed a provocative question. The tip and technique was, think about how what you're going to say, I'm going to say, in response to the person I've been listening to, the person's been telling me something, I've been listening to him and not merely to my opinion of what the other person is saying, her or him, and I'm going to tell him something back. I'm going to say something back. I'm going to respond in a form of words. So what do you think? Think about, so the recommendation, the tip and technique is to think about how what I'm going to say is going to land. Think about how what you're going to say is going to affect the other person. Just as an attorney would not ever ask a question without knowing the answer already, give some thought. I mean, this one is not quite as sure, but give some thought to how they're going to react. And so provocatively, I said, you know, and I quote, do you know what your problem is? Do you know what's wrong with you? Well, a bold statement of the obvious, right? How do you think it's going to go? 
not well. It implies there's something wrong with the other. Such a statement is objectifying, devaluing, making them less than. Now, here's the thing. We often say that without using so many words. We often imply it. So even if the other person acknowledges having issues, and that's got to be a part of being a human being, right? How is that being helpful, much less empathic? So maybe you don't want to be helpful. Ah, the truth comes out in the end, right? So the, you know, so so take a step back. Same idea. Here's one for the men. And this is part of uh, my stand-up comedy routine. If this, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't have one of those uh, yet, but I'm working on it. If you want to guarantee a fight, ruin the evening or weekend with your spouse or special someone, just say what? A powerful example of what not to say. You are just like your mother, right? Even if she has a great relationship with her mom, and I know a lot of women who do, that's not a setup for affection and relatedness and success. That's not a setup for uh, clearing for relatedness. Rather, it shuts down communication, right? I mean, uh, and, and so this is an obvious example in that you know what the reaction is going to be. You can clearly see a reaction. So, so clean up the act, right? So from a, the perspective of empathic responsiveness, I mean, your mother really has the gift of experience and wisdom in this area, and then allow your special honey to point out your mo- her mom's limitations, right? If, you say, if I say something good, I'll then hear everybody has strengths and limitations. I'll hear the other side of the story, because people tend to, to relate that way. So from the perspective of empathic responsiveness, You want to anticipate. I want to anticipate what the reaction is going to be. Rather, say something like, so take it up a level. I can see you're dealing with something here. I can see you're caught between a rock and a hard place. I can see you're stressed out, assuming that that's a case, the case. I can see whatever it is that the other person is confronting and then say, ask, here's a thought, consider the possibility. Do you have any idea of what to do? Yeah, if you really have some guidance or some coaching or you have some experience in the matter and you've got, you know, you've got actually got a specific actionable recommendation that does occasionally happen. Don't hurt yourself. That's a good recommendation. Now maybe it's more specific. Ask permission before giving the advice, before giving the coaching, before giving the recommendation, before giving the guidance. There's nothing more annoying than unsolicited feedback. People will hear a great idea, but it's not solicited, so it doesn't get through. Really give the other person a chance to say yes or no, or maybe this is just not the right moment, right? That happens, actually, more often than we allow. You know, have you really got a sense of where they're at? And so we need empathy to expand empathy, right? This is a bootstrap operation. This is an ascent routine. Uh, naturally, hindsight is twenty twenty. And if it is, call it out. A lot of good advice comes after you know hindsight is twenty twenty. And if I knew then what I know now, things had gone differently. And sometimes that can be valuable in opening up a better possibility, a better opportunity, a better scenario going forward into the future. And by the way, this is not neuroscience or even deep, deep empathy research. This is straight out of where else? Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Don't knock over the hornet's nest if you want to gather honey, right? I mean, so now there's more going on here than that as well. However, that's never a bad start. Here's the thing. We know, you and I know, not to push the other person's buttons. And at least from time to time, we do it anyway. The ultimate unempathic moment, the ultimate breakdown in empathy. I know it's not going to go well if I bring up her mother. And lo and behold, there I did it again. Is that self? So now I'm kind of making this up, but hey, in my life, it's happened. And on many other occasions, it doesn't happen, and the result went a lot better. So, you know, all of this is good news. So what's going on here? Part of it, at least, here's, consider the thought, consider the possibility that uh, there's something in human nature. We are uh, designed in such a way that we inevitably have opinions, and we like to share them. 
And so the recommendation is to make that distinction. You're not wrong for having opinions. I'm not wrong for having opinions. I'm not even wrong for wanting to share them. I, and I'm not even wrong on those occasions when I do share them and things don't go well. It's just I don't like the result. You see, you didn't like the result. Well, you might want to try something different next time. Isn't that interesting? And so this leads, actually, this is a beautiful segue to the next tip and technique. We seem to be designed to, to express our opinions. And even we do that even though we know maybe that's not going to be productive. And so the next technique, this has been going around in subtle and perhaps less subtle ways, uh, stop telling people what's wrong with them and act confidently to repair disruptions in relatedness, to, dis to repair disruptions in communication and understanding by acknowledging one's contribution to the disruption. So I acknowledge, uh, sweetheart, oh dear spouse, oh special someone of mine, that that, that was really a clumsy thing to say. And that wasn't really what I even when I think about it, I don't that's not even true. I don't even believe that. And and clean clean it up, right? So the recommendation, the the, the tip, if you will, it's really more of a technique than a tip, but act to to repair the disruptions in disrated in relatedness and to to repair the disruptions in communication by acknowledging one's contribution. I messed up. That can be those three words. Uh, no, not I love you, although perhaps also at the right time that also. But those three words, I messed up. I messed up. In other words, clean up your act. If you owe people money, arrange a payment plan. If you've lied and betrayed, acknowledge the lack of integrity and the damage done. Now, you may get to hear a thing or two coming back. I have gotten to hear on occasions a thing or two coming back at me. You may even hear a thing or two, you know what's wrong with you. You know what your problem is. Now, I just told you not to do that, and here it is coming back at you, coming back at me. I want to speak in the first person to an extent and own it because nevertheless, this is the opportunity. You got to be with it and be with the consequences of one's deeds and misdeeds. And this is not necessarily a rational process or a completely logical, consistent process. This is an empathic process. This is a process of cleaning up inauthenticity within inauthenticity and clawing one's way back to wholeness and completeness and inauthenticity. And this is actually the first step in recovering, or a step to be sure, in recovering one's power in relation to empathy and relation to the relatedness that makes empathy possible. The person might or might not want to have anything to do with you, right? I might not get what I want, and in one or two cases, that I am not going to get what I want. That's definitely not in the cards. Although, never say never, one never knows for sure. But what I am going to get, cleaning up, repairing, what I'm going to get is freedom to move and to be empathic in the relationship. So that's powerful and significant and opens up, right? It's a technique for opening up the possibility, a clearing for empathy. Because remember, as we were actually discussing at some length on the uh, t the time before last on the six seventeen fifteen uh, conversation, uh, one way of teaching empathy this this deserves repeating. Well, can you teach empathy? Controversy. It's a controversial question. One way of teaching empathy is to remove the obstacles to empathy, remove the resistance to empathy, and then empathy naturally comes forth. Empathy shows up. Our natural empathy is given a chance to engage for most human beings. I mean, one may, one may find some exceptions towards the skinny ends of the bell curve, but I am bold. I put it out there 
for the most part, most human beings are naturally empathic or can want to be, and given half a chance, will be on a good day, as we say in the business, right? Nevertheless, things like this, lack of lack of integrity, owing people a lot of money, and lack of clarity about that, that's just an example. That's just an example. Um, get in the way. And if one removes the obstacles, a long list of things, uh, then naturally then one's natural empathy is given a chance to engage. And it looks like the empathy itself is expanding and growing because of the training. And in many ways it is. And it's because uh, of allowing the natural process to occur. And so let, keeping that in mind, moving on, uh, next tip and technique, we're gaining some ground here, how to expand one's empathy. Being known for acknowledging and recognizing the contribution of others and the ways in which others contribute and make a difference. So take a step back, consider. The cynic says, the, the, the guy who's resigned and, and cynical says, this is like probably out of some sitcom, right? No good deed goes unpunished, no matter how great one's accomplishments. There are the nattering nabobs of ne negativity that will find something wrong. Their commitment is precisely that there must be something wrong here. The voiceover right in the back of your head, like uh, the voiceover is uh, there must be something wrong here and they'll keep at it until they find something wrong. Now, that's what not to do. That's what, not, and notice that that's going to have to be managed. There's always, there's, I say always, but really there's often, all too frequently, that conversation is in the space and one has to just be bold in the face of it and not let it distract one and not play into it, participate into it. Recognition and acknowledgement of accomplishment and achievement are not empathy. They open up access to empathy. They enable empathy and make empathy possible. In another sense, acknowledging the other person's humanness, their humanity, means being with them, whether or not you know exactly what they're experiencing in the particular moment. So it means, I mean, for one to get in touch with what exactly is their experience, one has to be open to that. So for example, in the work I do with survivors, whether it's domestic violence or bullying in the playground or survivors of serious life-changing automobile accidents or emotional deprivation and degradation, which would not necessarily be described as traumatic by any ordinary description. For example, if one had a video from a webcam at some point or another, if there's the other person feels unsafe, they may nevertheless take a risk and courageously share whatever it is that they're dealing with. And for the person in question, I mean, it may not have been what might look like a trauma if you had a video of what was said or whatnot, but to them it was really challenging and difficult and significant, even if not, technically it's not true. It was a big, let's just, speaking in plain English, it was a big honking upset and they're still dealing with it. That's like the fancy, you know, technical term for trauma and they courageously share that. So acknowledge it, right? It's short and sweet. In the face of being misunderstood or dismissed or not gotten or embarrassed or shamed or ashamed or ashamed of being ashamed, that's the moment. If one has been listening, if one has been authentically being with the other person in their struggle and in their stress, that's the moment for recognition and acknowledgement. I can see you had something to survive there. Quote, I acknowledge your courage in surviving, you know, what you had to survive, and then you fill in the blanks a little bit as appropriate. I acknowledge your courage in sharing courageously what you had to go through and deal with and keep it simple and keep it direct and find out what opens up 
at that point. So we're coming up on a break here, and I want to give you something to think about over the break. The world is not known for being generous with recognition and acknowledgement, right? People are in survival, finance, scheduling, daycare. For, well, if only I had some good daycare, I get my life back, right? Something like that. See what opens up when you acknowledge what they're dealing with, whether, you know, they're being a great parent, they're doing the tough job that needs to be done. That, that It's a great moment. It, it creates the possibility of empathy, and then it creates empathy itself. So here's where we're at. We're going to go to a sponsorship break momentarily, and then we're going to come back and have even more tips and techniques on how to expand your empathy. Empathy is oxygen for the soul. So if you're having trouble breathing, keep with it, stick with it, maybe consider the possibility you need more empathy and we're going to deliver some right after the break. This is Lou Augusta and a rumor of empathy. We'll be right back. You are listening to a rumor of empathy to reach Lou Augusta or his guest today. Please call in to 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. You may also send an email to a rumor of empathy at gmail.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back. This is Lou Augusta. Welcome back to A Rumor of Empathy. Empathy is like oxygen for the soul. So if you're short of breath, Maybe you need more empathy. We're going to get some. So really, that's a challenge. How to make present empathy in the space, in the conversation, on the air, on the radio. I'm not sure. It's a challenge that I have fully satisfied or engaged or even fully understand. Nevertheless, that's the commitment to make empathy present. So... Moving right along, we're going to continue with the commitment to lay out empathy tips and techniques, and you get to practice. And please write in or call and let me know what the result is and what are the issues that come up and what are the obstacles that you overcome and what are the obstacles that you find engaging. And so the next tip, and it's really a technique, and it's going to require creating a context and a background, but it's easy to state. And the challenge is going to be like to say, okay, Lou, how is this an empathy tip or technique? So here it is. Go to the art museum. I repeat, go to the art museum. Go to the local art museum, wherever you are. Or look at some art. You know, let's say you're living somewhere in the middle of the desert. Uh, you might have to go online. Go to the online art museum. There are ways to do it. So now what I'm going to suggest and how to get at it. So this is going to be practice in being present, in being available to the experience that you are present to. And now art and natural beauty, you can also go to the Grand Canyon and get some of the same effects. Uh, but and that would be in Arizona in the USA, right? That's the one I'm talking about. Uh, but here's what I'm going to say not to do. So we're going to kind of back into it and do it indirectly. So that picture of Picasso, it's supposed to be a woman, but frankly, it looks like to a lot of people, it looks like an alligator or a crocodile. That picture of Duchamp, it's supposed to be a picture of Paris, but actually it looks like Tokyo after Godzilla was done rampaging through the streets. Same idea with music. You listen to Beethoven's pastoral symphony. Da, 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 right? I'm not getting it quite right. But you hear the birds tweeting and the thunder and the rain dropping. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But the empathic moment, the empathic moment comes when you're just present with the picture or the music without making it mean anything. You remove the what does it represent filter what does it look like is it a picture of a guy or of a crocodile or you know insert your cute animal of choice <laughs> and maybe you like it or maybe you don't like it or maybe it sounds like a bird after a rainstorm and there's nothing wrong with that 
right? But you distinguish that, set that aside, and let it be. That is about me, the observer. That is about you looking at the picture, not about the picture, the picture or the person. So you're relating, trick, you're relating to the other person as you would relate to a work of art. I can hear the cynical voice over at this point. What a piece of work. The boss is really a piece of work. Well, that may also be true. There may also be some truth to that. Nevertheless, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? That's not authentically who you are or who the other person is. You go to the art institute or the, the local, or call it up online if you know, or if you have, in order to get in touch with micro expressions. Now, here's the empathy training specifically. We're getting into it here. This has been this is requiring some work here, but the micro expression is the fine grained detail of the experience, of the experience of the other person, of my experience of the other person, by indirection of vicarious experience of their experience, right? So just you're just open to your own experience. And that experience includes the impact of the other, whether the other is a human being or a work of art or whatever it is, the fine-grained detail of the experience of the other. The boss says, for example, the team has to work this weekend. Now, before pretending to be okay with that, a momentary expression of pain and anguish flashes across one's face prior to masking it with a grin and bear its smile. Another example, a man and a woman are in couples counseling and they claim to be respectful of one another, but she ex or he expresses dislike for their dog and a micro expression of contempt flashes across his face, which is barely visible at one third of a second. And if one had a webcam and slowed down the movie, then one would see the momentary, almost instantaneous expression of contempt. A micro expression. Or another third extreme case. A person on the inpatient psychiatric unit claims to not feel suicidal, but then checks out and steps in front of the bus with tragic results. If, you, if one had a tape, the webcam, one would see a micro expression of anger or despair or rage or some big honking upset flash in effect momentarily across the individual's face before being masked by a smile, right? Or another example, we're talking art, the famous picture of the Mona Lisa by, by Leonardo da Vinci, the, the La Gioconda, she's smiling. And yet there's also a micro expression there of something else, something equal X. Is it a guilty secret or ambivalence? There's some sadness mixed in. That's a micro expression. So the training the tip and technique, if you will, I'm sending you to the art museum, go to the art museum and be there with the art. That means stand in front of it and just be with it without worrying or wondering, or, I mean, you're going to worry or wonder what it looks like. Is it a crocodile or is it a koala bear or whatever is occurring? You're going to have those thoughts. You can't not have it. As human beings, we're designed to have momentary, instantaneous judgments and evaluations. Very hard to stop. Almost, it almost never stops. After years of meditation, what has happened, the, the, the meditator still has the thought, but he or she distinguishes it and does not let it get in the way. So I'm standing there in front of the, the whatever, it, I'm making this up, right? The Picasso that looks like the alligator and it's all great. And be with there whatever, what, with what it is. And that's the training because when I go back and have a conversation with a person, a human being, I'm going to bring the same technique to the relatedness, to the experience and be aware. See, so here's the, here's the thing. Here's the, here's the result. If you pick up, if you are aware of 
a micro expression of which I'm unaware, then your empathy is more refined. Your empathy is more delicate. You are more in touch with fine grained, fine grained, key term, fine grained detail of experience. You're in more touch with that than I am, let's say. You have a greater delicacy of empathy. And in that sense, you're aware of things that others might not be aware of. You have taken ground. You have expanded your empathy so that you can see, oh, yeah, he's throwing a temper tantrum. But really, he's lonely. He's misbehaving, right? But, I mean, now, what to do about it is another problem. But you've got to get in touch with the situation before you can make a difference. He's misbehaving in a certain way, this or that or the other thing. He's lonely. He's not getting the respect to which he feels he's in titled. Now, I'm not saying whether he is or he isn't. And that he gives himself, he tells himself a story and gives himself a permission to do that. And that maybe gives you a sense of where is the intervention. So, you know, you come to Lou Augusta, you're going to get empathy, good faith, best effort. Empathy doesn't mean I'm a rubber stamp. I'm not going to rubber stamp your narrative, but I'm not going to in I am not going to invalidate it either. I'm going to give it a listening and a hearing and I'm not going to judge and evaluate, right? This is this is the situation you want to in turn put yourself in and enable you to be with the other person in such a way that you get what's going on there. And so we've covered some ground here. We're coming up on the top of the hour. There are more empathy tips and techniques. Uh, expand empathy by giving the person back their experience in a narrative, in a form of a story that shows an empathic relatedness such that you give them their experience in a way that they're able to integrate it, in a way that they're able to make sense out of it, that they had not been able to do so before. And so uh, it enables them to say or not say whether you're with them. And if you're not, then you get to hear about it and you get to try again if you're really good at it. And so to make this distinction, you have to be able to listen to yourself so that you can hear all the ways in which you're interrupting yourself, all the stories you're telling yourself, all the opinions, judgments, assessments, evaluations you're giving yourself, which simply stated are getting between you and listening to the other person, right? Put it in the first person, Lou. I got to distinguish all the narratives, opinions, judgments, and evaluations, which on a, on a bad day get in the way. And, and once I distinguish them, then I am really able to be with the other person. So I want to hear from you. We're coming up, as I say, on the top of the hour, and I want to take a minute or two to express my appreciation for your gracious and generous listening. My commitment is to get the oxygen to your soul that you need in order to have a rich experience of aliveness and vitality. Uh, next week, I am calling the show the Round Trip Empathic Roundup. We've coming up, we've had about 10 shows since the start of this series, and I've been privileged and excited and engaged in having conversations with a wide variety of engaging individuals. So I'm going to do a Round Trip Roundup in summary. We're gonna, you're going to hear about Dan McDuff, and, the, and he's not going to be here, but we're going to talk about the software on empathic relatedness that he had, Jim Garbarino on listening to Killers. That was a very confronting show. Alice Dreger on Galileo's middle finger speaking truth to power and how does that play with empathy. Stan Shat on alien love uh, and what all occurs there in examples of otherness. Uh, Rathika Sharma on stopping domestic violence. Doctors Jesse Viner and Dale Monroe Cook on empathy with emerging adults and parenting. Uh, David Howe, empathy, what it is and, and why it matters and the book I wish I had written. So I invite you to join me next week 
for another rumor of empathy. Empathy lives like oxygen for the soul. See you next week. Thank you for tuning in to A Rumor of Empathy with Lou Augusta. Please join us again next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. We hope to see you again next week. We'll be right back.